I am I'm a researcher at the National Center for Computer Animation, and I'm an artist with the Anna Lemmer Group. And today I'll be talking with my colleague um, from the National Center for Computer Animation, Dr. Feike Eick Anderson, principal academic, and Deborah Chuchina, who is an artist as well and a lecturer at the University of the Arts London. And um, we will be presenting our paper, New Heritage, New Media Art Between Cultural Heritage Experience and Artifact. And with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Okay, Oliver, can you move the slides forward? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, the first thing, perhaps if we establish some terms, so when we look at cultural heritage and the topic of cultural heritage, the first thing that one really needs to realize and understand is that culture and heritage are not luxury goods, but uh, basic needs. Uh, or if we ought to call it uh, that, we could say you know, almost the basic staple and uh, the foundation on which any social, mental, and cultural development depends. So in short, cultural heritage is um, the uh, essence of what we are and cultural heritage are the essence of what we are. And uh, cultural heritage as such is humanity's main source of self-expression and self-realization, springs from a community or society and is then transmitted um, through this community or society among, and among the group and from generation to generation. And it takes many different forms, really encompassing everything uh, uh, influenced um, uh, or created by humanity. So. It's the various tangible forms or various artifacts, buildings, landscapes, but also intangible forms such as customs, practices, uh, places, objects, artistic expressions or values. Next slide, please. So when we look at um, uh, cultural heritage, um, there are really two different types of this that can be distinguished. So I mentioned both briefly. So it's the tangible heritage. So any representation of value systems, beliefs, traditions, and lifestyles produced by human activity that are actually um, manifested physically. So it's the built environment, but can also be the natural environment uh, as such as it influences uh, humanity, but also manipulated by humanity. So, you know, through the creation of, uh, you know, um, agricultural um, field systems, gardens and so on, but also artifacts where we then distinguish between movable artifacts. So paintings, sculptures, pretty much anything that uh, you know, is of a size and weight that can be transported. And then immovable uh, heritage, so buildings, uh, monuments, uh, anything that creates a site that is located somewhere in the world, but that can't be shifted. And then finally, we also now see underwater heritage. That could be um, shipwrecks, but also uh, parts um, or elements of human habitation that have been lost, for example, due to rising sea levels. The other part of heritage that exists is the intangible heritage that is immaterial, but inextricably, inextricably linked to the tangible heritage. So we can look at things such as traditions, oral history, traditional skills and technologies, religious ceremonies, music, or specific where we can look at specific musical styles as well. Uh, one example would be Irish harping that was um, put into the um, uh, United Nations list of um, you know protected intangible heritage. I think in 2019, but also uh, uh, lots of other elements of performing arts that fall into the um, element of the intangible cultural heritage. Next slide, please. Now, then we get to new heritage, which is really the intersection of cultural heritage with new media. So when we talk about the creation of heritage experiences that make use of modern digital media facilities, 
uh, and of new media, we call this intersection with the cultural heritage, new heritage. And it is really this use of mainly interactive digital media that creates new op uh, opportunities for novel approaches to actually presenting the cultural heritage which means we are no longer uh, limited to just the simple display of tangible artifacts, but we can also include elements of intangible heritage to create more holistic experiences. One thing to note is that very often uh, the actual complexity of creating new heritage artifacts is underestimated, which really needs to be avoided. Uh, and it's uh, because people very often overlook that um, when we are dealing with new media, uh, we are dealing with really what um, could be considered the cutting edge of technology. It is very new, uh, but uh, by default also um, kind of an unknown and particularly if we look at uh, modern computer graphics, um, in a way also still quite unstable in as what we um, are dealing with systems that aren't fully mature, that are prone to um, errors and the complexity of dealing with these things is um, actually one of them from the software engineering and computer science point of view, um, the type of the most complex computing system around and uh, making, things that, uh, making things that work and that work reliably is a, a very, very complex um, task. Um, next slide, please. So if we then look at uh, the major man or the main manifestation of new heritage, it's really when they are combined with the interactive virtual environments. And there we find that it's, uh, similar or almost identical infrastructure to that that is required for the creation of modern video or computer games. So um, that then creates an additional difficulty because um, see, our audiences, um, by having been exposed to commercial entertainment video games, also have very, very high expectations. Uh, so anything that in, say, the visual quality or the way that uh, interaction with it works doesn't um, meet the similar level to the um, uh, modern computer games is not, um, especially by the digital natives, uh, it's not quite as... Um, uh, accepted not as easily. So um, that puts additional pressure on the creation of new heritage, especially considering that our budgets for this are considerably lower than the multi-million uh, pound or dollar budgets that they have for the creation of video games. However, um, the same technology, so games technology, is particularly suited to the preservation and presentation of intangible heritage, because we can use it to tell stories uh, and um, allow people to actually interact with it. So even stepping into specific points uh, in space um, or time to experience different places. Um, and this then also includes the use of modern technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So it opens up new dimensions. We can create highly immersive experiences uh, that, um, as I mentioned uh, before, you know, can transport audiences to different points in time and space and allow them to experience elements of the world that otherwise would have been um, hidden from them. Another thing that needs to be remembered when we look at these technologies, though, is that they are not as universal as one would hope. So um, virtual reality is very, very popular now. It's, uh, um, in a way, a hype. Uh, but very few people actually have access to reliable virtual uh, reality um, uh, technology and systems. 
Similarly, um, everything that uses nowadays augmented reality and makes use of smartphones, it also almost assumes that everyone has access to a smartphone. Uh, and believing that this is a universally applicable is also a fallacy. So one always needs to take into consideration that there are still people out there that don't use uh, um, mobile phones that are smartphones. Anyway, looks like that my part i think deborah is next yeah what to you deborah thank you for that so just a, a quick note that my residents downstairs are having a very active day so it's very loud in the background i do apologize ahead of time um thank you very much for the opening um and nice to be with you all here and for the next uh, few minutes and the next few slides I'll probably just talk through um, Baigala, which is the project that was within this paper um, acting as a case study to kind of fold in the idea of new heritage. Um, and it, it's kind of put together more anecdotally um, with some elements of research topics that I was looking at when this project was sort of being constructed. So I'll start with, um, in 2008, I traveled to Mongolia. It was around minus 20 degrees Celsius. The ground was dry and the air smelled like dried grass and firewood from the night before. And the horse whom my friend and I rented from, um, a Tuvan family, was strong, as pictured here. We rode for several hours to get to the base of the Altai Mountains, where it spans through Russia, China, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. Next slide, please. In 2017, I had an opportunity to return for research in producing Baigala. Baigala is a project that transports participants to remote areas in Mongolia. Viewers explore and move between two 360 film scenes, an afternoon visit to a family's yurt and to a site by a lake, allegedly known for gold mining. This still is from the first film scene for the week I spent with a herding family that took me in very generously. They took me to see sites of significance, coal mines to the lake in the second scene. I had a chance to listen and talk about their experiences and observations about what was happening in a localized context. Next slide, please. I documented the locations while being told the folklore of the areas. We went to Sohor Lake, Kushid coal mine, Bulgan Sum, as well as to the border where Mongolia meets China. So here is the second still, as a still at the second scene. The scene at the lake is rendered to capture elements of psychedelic tropes, which intends to explore spiritual aesthetics that might emerge from new environmental and ecological narratives. Next slide, please. And here's a brief um, sort of capture photos of uh, the sort of spherical lens that you see through um, capturing 360 film. And just as a sort of contextual bit, and I think I always like reminding myself when I'm also there, Mongolia is home um, to about 139 species of mammals, 400 spe 450 species of birds, 22 species of reptiles, six species of amphibians and 76 fish species. The flora and fauna is unique to its area and endangered. There you can find Siberian larches, cedars, spruces, pines, firs and birches. The human species population is registered at around 3.2 million and horses at three. Um, and here on the, on the left, I've explained the sort of lens and, and to the right is you'll see a sort of um, image of the Gobi Desert from, from quite high up. Next slide, please. So the movement from intimate space to wide stretch of land where the horizon in all 360 directions who are who that's deceptive in distance was important to capture for the project. Here's an image of the traditional Mongolian gur and details of construction from the book Architecture of the Nomads. And the last concluding slide. The audience enters a wooden felt structure that is inspired by the design of a traditional Mongolian gur, giving giving the audience a physical contextualizing before becoming immersed in the 360 experience of the two scenes I've just described. This piece was shown at the BNA as well as the Slade, which was a really um, a, a good opportunity to share the stories of resource and production entanglements from a much lesser known part of the world. 
the labor and affect is often stripped when the object or product is seen in its finality. And here was a moment to really show the context in a sort of museum setting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I experienced the piece and I absolutely loved it. And what Ike was saying before that it transports you into a different time and place is so true here. And you're doing this both in a domestic setting and then, um, yeah, and, and, and in terms of the landscape, it was really fantastic. I'm very briefly going to talk about the piece Kima Kala that we were um, commissioned to produce for National Gallery X with the Analima Group. Kima Kala came um, out of a residency. National Gallery X is a studio that was created between the National Gallery, King's College London, and Google Arts and Culture. And the Analema Group, for those of you who don't know us, is an art collective that is focusing on the relationship between sound and vision. And um, as part of this residency, we look in particular at color in the collection of um, the National Gallery. So we selected several paintings and um, honed down on three of them and were specifically interested in color palettes, color harmonies, um, and then translating these colors into data and from data into sound and a 360 visual sound experience. Um, this residency was cut short by COVID, so we had to completely rethink what we were doing. And um, initially the 360 experience was supposed to be physical, it turned out to be um, a virtual experience, but um, as part of the residency, we were able to work both virtually and um, in a real setting with some of the scientists at the National Gallery, including Marika Spring, the head of science, and Joe Petfield, the principal scientist. And um, it was really interesting to try to understand historic context of color pigmentation, value of color, you know, the, the, um, which color was rare, which color was used um, for, for, for what purpose. Um, in the context of these various different paintings and then to work with this information and to try to translate it into a 360 massive experience. So as I said, we were translating color into data and the data into sound. And the sound was effectively um, driving some of the visual representation that you'll see in a second um, and vice versa. So it became one big feedback loop where the one was influencing the other. And um, so we, we're looking at these three paintings, and um, I will just um, show you a very short reel. Can you hear this? You cannot. Okay. So this was Susan Forster, the Deputy Secretary of the um, National Gallery, um, talking about the um, impact of color um, on the mind. And um, sorry, I will just go to the next video, I think. Um, here you can see how this piece is now working. So essentially you can watch it both on your phone or you can watch it in VR. And accessibility was really key for us when developing the piece so that everybody at home in a time when everybody was in lockdown and wasn't able to visit the National Gallery collection would be able to access these paintings um, in 360 using the gyroscope on um, a mobile phone. And um, you can also use Google um, Glasses to watch it um, in VR, sorry, Google Cardboard. And um, here you can see um, the, the piece itself. It's a very, um, very meditative piece, very slow piece. Um, and it works also with 360 sound. So as you're moving the camera around, the sound is also moving and responding to your movements. And um, yeah, as I said, it's a, it's, um, the idea is for you to experience color in a very immersive way. Um, and also to give you a degree of authorship so you can navigate through the space in your own time and you can basically you know, direct this um, abstract film um, in 360 and um, watch it over and over again. So this was the first piece uh, inspired by Van Gogh. The second piece was inspired by Monet. And we beta tested um, all of these pieces and um, did see that um, there, there was a relationship between interest in the actual piece and um, the, the, an interest in the, the artwork itself. And also this idea of wanting to revisit the original collection after watching the piece. Yeah. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I will just um, rush through these last slides. What now. about one minute, um, Oliver? Fantastic. Okay, I should be able to wrap up. So this is the third piece, which is um, 
the Anafini portrait by Jan van Eyck. And here is a bit different. It's a three-dimensional exploration of the space. We're building this in research by Rutke and Janssen um, at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And um, they provided quite a, a lot of information on the actual spatial um, uh, design, the layout of the um, of the Anafini portrait setting. And so we, we created this in 3D and um, you can essentially drive through this space um, and explore these colors as a, um, as a spatial experience of the space. So you're effectively in the room together with the couple and you're able to experience these colors um, also spatially, which is a bit different to the other pieces. So all of them are online on the National Gallery website and I would encourage you to watch it just very quickly. Summing up feedback was um, resoundingly positive and we reached out to but I have more than 150,000 people, which was great during lockdown to be able to provide people with access to artworks um, in the time when the galleries were closed. Um, and we had quite a lot of press. And also the, the National Gallery itself was um, very happy with, with the result. Um, yeah, this is um, maybe just the concluding slide um, that as Ike said, there's this idea that um, new heritage can be more than just preservation and conservation of heritage and tangible and intangible heritage. It can really augment it and um, move you through um, different experiences, whether this is transcending time and space or whether this is providing context to um, things that are not necessarily um, visible at first sight. Um, there's definitely a new dimension that new media can offer. And um, yeah, I think, Terry, would you also touched upon this idea of um, access and, and the importance of, of providing access to these new participatory art forms is really, really exciting for us. So I think this is it from us. And um, yeah, please feel free to check out the links and um, we're here for any questions you might have. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you also, Aiki and Deborah.